Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's actually a, a pleasure uh, to be back here for the MIT Tech Review, but it's also a pleasure to be back in Toulouse. Does it work? Oh, sorry. Yes. So life is fragile. Just a month ago, 30 minutes earlier, and I was not here speaking with you. Unfortunately, my friends and everyone attending her birthday didn't have my chance. They were all killed except one person uh, during this terrible attack. Of course, it's a life-changing event. Uh, you question yourself. And um, it's the first time I've been speaking publicly and even privately since the event. So hopefully, I'll, I'll try to make some sense out of what I'm saying. We live in a weird paradox today. We live in a paradox where we can't really imagine the future. We can't project ourselves. And if we can't imagine the future as fast as we're destroying the old one, we're basically stuck in the present. That's the problem we have today. We're in the present, always. People worship the past, and we think about the future, but in a way, everything we talk about in the future was already written in sci-fi books over the last 100 years. I just like to remember to the people who worship the past that the, the past is amazing, except if you're the two ladies who have to hold the ice when we didn't have any fridge. <laughs> so the question is, what can we change? What can we change in this world? When you think about the post-war mass production, what I call the billion plus product experience, the, the soulless experience of building the same product for one billion people. This is when Coca-Cola was introduced. But the fact that we create a generic experience that we can't escape off, and we have to pay the cost. Climate change, we're destroying the planet to build product that you don't even need. I just wanted to put this picture because this is the Antarctica a few months ago, taken from space. I was lucky a month ago to be in Greenland with uh, Professor Rob Correll, and I'm telling you, 1.5 degree, there's no way we can go above that. It's going to be terrible. I've been in technology since I'm 10. I love computers. I love modem. I love the internet. I love everything that is around technology. But we have to face it. We screwed up. We failed. Everyone wants a phone. Everyone wants a phone. We want billions of phones. And again, we're destroying the planet for that. Conflict minerals in Congo. You don't want to know where the stuff that we put on our iPhone is coming from, but look at the picture. And the real question is, do we really need to buy a billion new phone every year? Is it really necessary? Or is it that the way we program, the way we architect the app economy is probably wrong? If you think about how the CIA was trying to control the mind, you know, the science in the 60s, uh, you know, the mind control, Stanley Milgram and all the scientists of the time, if you think about all the social apps of today, they're like one level up. We've created an incredibly addictive drug. I mean, how many times do we actually even take our phones every day now? I don't even, I'm not even able to count. The other thing is, every time I go in San Francisco, I live in San Francisco, and I'm talking to my friends, basically, we've designed a world out of touch. This is Bill Maris, uh, the GM from Google Venture, and said, if we live in a world where the technology we're talking about, the phone, the apps, all this on-demand economy, are about for rich white per people in Silicon Valley, then we failed. And you want to know what? We probably did. Think about it. This is a, a funny uh, uh, 
thing, I've just tweeted that a few months ago. It's about the fact that there's an Airbnb, an Uber, or a Tinder for everything. I was just joking. Maybe someone has made a Tinder for dog. There's one. It's probably one there somewhere. The question is, we're trying to address very local needs, and we don't address the big problems. We have a culture of growth, growth, growth. We call that growth hacking, lean startup, whatever you want. But think about it. If your startup was a poultry, a poulailler like this, how would it look like? What does it mean to grow, to grow, to grow without any sense, without any meaning, at all costs? The other thing is there was a very interesting conference about cryptographers in New Zealand. You know there's a big debate right now about cryptology, but not only cryptology, and I'll get to this. And as you probably know, in the 50s, many scientists spoke against the danger of nuclear weapons. And I haven't heard anyone in our space talking about the servants and state. And I'm not talking about the emergency state. I'm talking about a world dominated absolutely by technology from the moment we wake up to the moment we sleep, and even having our sleep analyzed. What does it mean? Is it really the world we want to live in? This is the problem is, whatever comes next, we probably already failed the people. I mean, think about it, technology, surveillance, everything is now surveillance. For what? I mean, even now I stopped we using wearables because I don't even know where my data is going for. Who got the knowledge? Why don't I have the knowledge back? It, this data was supposed to make me a better person. And now I'm always busy for the wrong reason. And we're all busy for the wrong reason in this world. This is the problem, that's Philip Rugway, the guy who actually spoke out at this conference. He says, scientist, he was talking about cryptographers. But he could talk about people working in high frequency trade, algorithm design at Google or Facebook or any of these companies who have an impact on the world, had a duty to pursue social good in their work. And this is, today, the debate we are going to have. I mean, this technology is amazing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a Luddite. I don't believe that this technology is made for bad. But we have a duty to pursue social good in our work. We need to build a world that makes sense for everyone. Because if we don't, we're basically going to be remembered, like last month, that if we don't build a world where everyone feels happy, feels OK, I don't know what's going to happen. I think I've been quite faster than I expected, so I'm, I'm pretty much done with it. Thank you. <laughs> do you want to do questions? Q&A, I'll move on. Um, I think we have a, sometimes, so if you don't mind, I can ask, I, I'd okay, love sure. to ask you a few questions. Sure. Um, when Tariq was speaking, he was, I think he was reflecting the personality that we are trying to build in, in the community of innovators under 35. Um, I would like to, for you to explain us what, what you have found in other people that are in this community, the fact that you guys are looking at big problems and how usually the, the, the power to solve big problems comes with the responsibility to face the outcomes. Yeah, that was Spider-Man huh? with uh, great responsibility, great powers come great responsibilities. I think what's interesting in this community, but in general in science, is that uh, we have a knowledge, we have a talent. And my dad always told me when we have a talent, you have in some ways to make, it, to make the world benefit from it. If you don't, just selfish. I think one of the problems today is we have the smartest kid 
coming from the top university, especially in the US, best of a generation. And what they do is Tinder for dog or behavioral targeting advertising. And we're talking about people in the 50s, they were going to put this rocket in the moon. They had, or the Voyager, they had unbelievable problem to solve. And they were the smartest of their generation. And I think what's interesting with what you've done and with the MIT is, and in general with the community of science, is that we can invent a future that is better. And it doesn't have to be, when I say, don't take it the wrong way, corrupted by money, not because not everything should be a business. But before it is a business, it should be something sustainable. We are in a world where we can build a future that is sustainable. And there's so much ideas, so much availability, so much power, and so many actually kids were so smart and left out of it. That's one of, of my biggest uh, uh, concern today. The smartest kid of our generation might not have the tools. This is why we need to learn. We need to have our kids learn how to code, but also understand the world of algorithms so we can invent and design the world we want. Thank you, Karim. Thank uh, you. I think we have time, a couple of minutes to for one or two questions in the audience. If somebody wants to ask something, you can raise your hand. And otherwise, I will do it. Anyone? Now I can see you better. <laughs> OK, so um, I, want to, um, I want to also thank you for being so brave and, and sharing uh, that, that very private experience and very shocking to you. Um, any, any word you can give about, you know, the role of entrepreneurship and innovation in, in the years that are about to come in Europe, you know, in, in particular in France. How can we help? What can we do in, as innovators? Well, as you probably know, I, 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 did, um, I did a report for the, for the Minister of Technology two years ago, Fleur Pellerin, on talent. And there's always the question is, yes, uh, do we have the talent? Are we good enough? And, uh, that's true for Europe, that's France, but, but also uh, anywhere in Europe. And the truth is obviously, of course. What we lack sometimes is the will to go further and imagine the world we want to build. I mean, the beauty of Silicon Valley is not, people are super smart, but what's unique there is the fact that any idea, sometimes any stupid idea, <laughs> unfortunately, but any idea can be pursued. And I think, especially here, we're in Toulouse, like a heart of a, you know, a quite strong engineering hub in, in Europe. Uh, we need to invent new stuff all the time. And we need to let people invent them, fund them, fund their ideas. Because we never know what the future is going to come out. Think about it. Steve Jobs was just like a, a misfit. <laughs> and he, look at what the empire built. Look at the, all the things we, we, we could build. I think what makes Europe unique is that we have a different vision of the world, more inclusive. And if we can translate that into what we do as entrepreneurs, then we can definitely have a strong impact. Thank you, Karim. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Big applause for him, please. Yeah.